Okay, so we're still in section three. We got cut off a little bit there. Um, just uh, testing, make sure you haven't all fallen asleep. Uh, listening to these things, I know can be brutal, uh, but in any event, we're, we're still back in section three. We've uh, dealt with uh, first offers, and we're now going to move on to the next stage in the, in the bargaining negotiating process, um, which is uh, the counter offer, the first counter offer. And uh, there's not a lot on this slide that I haven't actually uh, said to you in the sense that how you respond. There's a way uh, that you respond, you don't know, react, uh, you, know, you separate information from influence and, and basically you stick to your strategy, etc., etc. Uh, I guess the two bullets of maybe the, and I think I've already said the third bullet, you follow what the delta is, you follow what the difference is in the sense of what your counter offer is going to create a difference, a distance between the two sides and you see where the mean is. And you're going to follow the mean all along because the mean's going to sort of chart where, where you are in, in terms of uh, your final result and it gives some indication of the direction so if you're not doing it I'm surprised I find a lot of people aren't doing that in uh, my mediations and a mediator does it all the time they're always trying to figure out how far apart uh, and uh, because the closer you get it down the, the, you know, the easier it is to sell this is so little you're really going to do all this for you know when you've got so little to, to cover here and the mean as I said gives you some direction to where the whole thing is going the uh, the, the, the middle point the questions I'm good negotiators, good bargainers, they ask lots of questions. I think it's something that's just not done enough and, and you should think about it. Am I asking enough questions? Now, the problem is you, you got to watch what the nature of the question is because you don't want to ask a question, get nothing out of it because if you ask a question, get nothing out of it, you basically lost it and it's this is a big mind battle in terms of competitive bargaining so you don't want to ask questions where you don't get something back. Um, if somebody comes at you with an offer uh, that's a, a little outlandish, very optimistic, etc. There's a couple of things you can do, but, but a nice way to do it is to ask the other side, send back a message, say, you know, have you got any new information that I'm not aware of which would support that offer? I'm just, I'm just curious. And um, it's kind of a win-win if they do have new information, hey, uh, you want to get that information because maybe it's something they're saving uh, for, um, uh, for impasse because sometimes new information at the end is, uh, has more utility. Uh, but if not, uh, you, at least you got across to them that hey, well this is the same old stuff then you mean and like what? So you you managed to, to to create a negative impression, telling them it's all bluff and, and getting that across, and, and you've also done your duty asking questions. So I'm just saying it's a bit of a trick, uh, uh, generally on how you ask questions with respect to offers. Um, you don't ask them to justify it; they'll always be able to justify it, and, and uh, well, you've not really gained anything. In fact, you've lost. Uh, now. Respond in accordance with their offer and your strategy. Now that makes sense, but let's just, let's just run through the scenarios because I think it's useful. If you have a moderate offer coming at you and, and you go back with a, a, a moderate uh, counter uh, offer, generally you're en route to settlement and it should settle. That, that's the way it normally works. Uh, so that, uh, so that, that's a good sign and we mediators love that. We can sort of stand aside and the parties can go all the way without even making final offers. They'll just kind of split the difference. It's an it, easy day for a mediator. If you're not going to reciprocate, though, uh, if you sort of, yeah, no, I still want to gain advantage here, and I'm, I'm, I'm bent on that, uh, then you're not going to reciprocate. And that's a challenging situation because the norm of reciprocity, it's a very strong norm. It basically, uh, it's something that's built into us, uh, kind of hardwired in there. If somebody does something, you want, to, you want to respond to it. It just brings it out and it's there. And it's all part of concession bargaining. It's why concessions are so important. So if you're not going to do that, you should be diplomatic. Uh, I think there's the only route there is to be diplomatic. You've got to at least indicate that you appreciate the offer, etc., etc. But I don't think you've really understood uh, of, of what our situation is completely and what our needs are, blah, blah, blah. And that's a little negotiation speak I just gave you, but that's how you do it, all right? And, and uh, I'm just saying. But you're probably on your way to what I would call a, uh, a single bluff impasse uh, because uh, one side is really prepared to play ball and the other side isn't. And as far as they're concerned, you know, we're going towards our resistance point, more or less, or a modest uh, expectation point where we share it, and uh, and you're you know you're you're way out on the other side. If you're facing an optimistic offer, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Some are so optimistic that you're you know it's kind of you put it in the outrageous uh, category, and, and uh, you you walk or you refuse, and and uh, and hope that the mediator gets involved. There's a bunch of steps there, but but generally you're going to respond uh, if it's. Uh, you recognize what it is, and, you, and you've got a couple of choices, but the one is to match it. Uh, in other words, you're going to stick to your expectation point, and you're almost guaranteed uh, a bluffing impasse here. 
in, in the sense that you're going to come to an impasse, both parties are going to be a long way apart, and there's a problem. Uh, but clearly, neither party's at its resistance point, but you've got yourself stopped up, and, it, and it's a very tough case. We're going we're to look at this just, just shortly. Um, so that, uh, and the other one is to, the other, other response is, is to basically respond with kind of a reasonable uh, reply. In other words, you're going beyond reciprocation here, you're sort of setting it, you're going to try and catalyze the whole process. And there's really not a lot of loss in doing that. I want to get that across. The second offer uh, uh, is, really, is really the one that tells you what's going on. So when you do it, obviously you have to describe that you recognize that their offer is you know, out to lunch, um, that it's not a realistic offer, etc., etc. You know, we're prepared to walk away here, but uh, we're going to try to do this. And you want to basically go through what I'm going to describe in the concession concession side generally you you want a link and and and, and you want to describe exactly what you what you, what you is expected to come back all right so those are kind of the scenarios on first counters so it's set up and now you're into uh, concession bargaining i've already made these points so i'm not going to remake them hey we need you know, concession bargaining is important you know get the whole thing going get people uh, feeling they've got a deal etc cetera, etc cetera. and and you know so that's uh, and, and and concession bargaining reciprocation should be at the sort of the same level if it's not if they're not satisfied I don't think there's a lot on that. Uh, um, and so here's the same message, not reciprocating, sends a strong message, and uh, same size. So I don't, I don't think there's a lot there I haven't already said. Uh, now, concession bargaining is intended to send a signal, all right? So that the traditional way and the way that it's supposed to be done is you have a diminishing amount. So you start at 10,000, 5,000, uh, 3,000, and the signal is we're coming, we're closing in on our resistance point. Really, of course, if you're bluffing, you're closing in on your expectation point. But that's how it's supposed to be. So the information is out there. So if you give them this on the same the same amount, it's all there's no information being exchanged. Nobody knows what's going on here. Well, where are they going? Uh, this could go on forever. Um, so that I'm just saying, generally diminishing returns is how it's done. And and the other part is that you should stay away from percentage bases. This is one little trick that I've seen it happen once at least where people were talking about percentages and anybody working off a larger amount with percentages is going to lose so a small point but uh, put it in there. And then here's the point I made back where you're giving a, a moderate, uh, you're giving a, a reasonable reply to a very optimistic opening offer. You got to link label and define it. You got to say exactly what you want. You've got to, if it's a, if it's a good offer from the other side, you should say that. You know, we recognize that you're trying to do this and, and because of that, we're going to link it and we're going to label it as being reciprocity, but this is what we expect, our expectations are, and that information should go back. And once again, the point I'm trying to get is that you should get that information going back. Um, and, uh, and in many cases, it, it, it perhaps it's because the mediators involved, parties aren't doing this. They're not kind of sending these messages back and forth. And I had to ask my mediation, well, do you want me to say anything when I, when I, when I carry your offer back? And then I say, well, I don't know, I have sort of some suggestions. And, and I'm not supposed to do that, really, as a mediator. It's not really our role. We can help out, but we have to stay neutral. And, and, and it's, it's something that you should be thinking about. Okay, what, what's the message I want to get back? Um, the second point is conduct. Um, it's not very well expressed there, is it? it? It's the conduct that goes around. What, what should you read into the fact that, that somebody's taken a long time uh, to... Uh, to get back to, particularly around impasse, you know, does that mean that they're uh, that they must be having trouble in there? I don't think so. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you, you, there is conduct associated with, with timing, particularly, and perhaps the more interesting one is is the defendants, uh, certainly the insurers, they know where they're going, and so that you know, plaintiffs take some time because they have to talk it over, da 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 da, and I think maybe they should not qu take quite so much time if they've really done their work ahead of time. They shouldn't have to do that. But in any event, uh, they do take their time. And uh, the insurer comes back, bang, 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 and you have more time, you come back and insure, bang, there are two minutes, and, and then you spend you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, with it, bang. So it, and, and what it is, is it's sending this message as it goes across that uh, we really know where we're going. And it's a message, I think, which is influential to a certain extent, because it means when we get to, when we get to impasse, we know exactly where we're going. Don't bother talking about it. And, and that's one of the games people play, is they want to make their final offer seem to have a lot of authority behind it, uh, all right? So to a certain extent, it's the type of conduct that you have to, you have to look at what's going on, the timing in particular, and, and try to read it, and, and it's part of the, unfortunately, it's part of the games people play. And final one is to be patient. Uh, hey, you cannot, uh, you cannot go in and try and change an offer 
or change something you said or give more information to the other side while they're in the, in the process of considering. Just don't do it. Um, and it's, uh, you just have to wait and uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll come to you. And concessions on multiple issues. I think that uh, the idea is you want to make people work hard for every concession, no matter how minor. Um, there's a bit of a, a point down the bottom here, make uh, unimportant concessions and portray them as important to you. And I've got this kind of caveat puffing only. And generally we're going to talk about one of the problems, uh, one of the great problems with bluffing and people uh, who uh, obey the rules of no misrepresentation, no significant misrepresentation, is that you have to be careful what you say. Uh, we're allowed to puff. We're allowed to say it's the best possible deal. You know, you'll never see this one again. I don't think anybody really has any problems with that. So when you are conveying a concession that's being important, you don't want to make it too material. So uh, I'm just saying be careful there. And it's, and it's the beginning uh, of, of an issue, which is one of the problems that you have with bluffing, because you can do whatever you want with offers. Hey, you can make any offer, outrageous offer. You can do that. There's nobody has any, any issues on that. So if you want to hide your bottom line through offering, just straight offering, you're, you're entitled to do it. And even though it's deception, it's not considered anything anybody's going to challenge you on. Um, but it's, it's what you say around those offers that causes the problems, all right, as we go forward into the ethical issues. Uh, conditional concessions, I'm just saying think about them. Certainly on multiple issues, I'm prepared to do this on the basis that you accept that. In other words, you kind of tie the conditions, and it's something that should come to mind if, if not. Uh, but conditional concessions are good uh, in a lot of circumstances, particularly where you're relying on new facts. And new facts come up all the time in... in in negotiation, and you don't know, you don't have a chance to, to verify them. You're a little mad, actually, because you don't have a chance to verify them. And what you do is, is you make your offer conditional on verification of the fact, and you write it into the final agreement. Uh, so it's a, it's a way to deal with facts. And if people really, really want to get a deal, and it's, they're relying on new evidence, that's how you cover themselves. Because if that's the case, they won't write it into their evidence. If they won't write it into their agreement, um, you know, forget about it. And then the whole question is, how do you, you know, how do you do? Uh, multiple interests, do you do it all at once? And I'm talking about interest, you know, not, not issues, not heads of damages or something like that. Interest. And our rule generally is that we make uh, an uh, offer on all, all interests. We don't try to pick them off one at a time. And uh, it's a good way to sort out priorities, which once again gets into great bluffing games around which interest, uh, I'm, which issue is really important, which interest is really important to me. And we're going to look at some of the hardball things. I don't know if they're really hardball, but there's, there's kind of misrepresentation of what interest is important to me, uh, the bogey and briar patch and things like this, as you'll see. But the idea is that you're trying to sort out the, the priority of the issues, and sometimes the other side is going to try to keep the deception thing going to a certain extent and uh, trying to mislead to you on what you think is your important issue. Um, dealing with bluffing impasse, well, the bluff, um, you know, we, uh, we understand it. A bluffing impasse shouldn't really occur, should it? Both parties are above their resistance point. Theoretically, they should keep on going. I mean, that's basically what it is. Hang in there and they'll keep on going. Um, it doesn't always happen that way, and, and bluffing and passes are a real challenge. And it's one of these areas where I think mediators earn their money, because often the only way you can do it is, get, is getting a good proactive mediator involved. What's the cause of a bluffing impasse? Well, first of all, there's kind of the idea of sticking to your expectation point, because this is what you're, this is what good bargainers do. They hang in there and they force a situation and they don't give up. And, and they and the person that kind of hangs in longest tends to do better in the business. It's the sad truth. So that's kind of in everybody's mind. No, I'm not giving in here, and I'm not going to be the first to blink either. Because if I'm going to the first to blink, I'm indicating I want the deal more than you. And so much of 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 of, of bargaining is not tipping your hand, not not showing that you need the deal more than them, because that's the whole leverage play, that's where it all turns, is who needs the deal more than the other side, uh, in terms, uh, we'll, we'll decide how it all ends up. Um, multiple parties, you get one a whole bunch on one side, and they really can't agree, so, so th there's a problem there, it's, it's not so much a bluffing, a bluffing um, issue as an ability to get yourself you know, all together. The big one is losing face. Uh, clients and lawyers, they get themselves in this position, and they, they can't back down. It's hard. <laughs> You've already gone along. It's easier on single bluff because in a single bluff, you know you're bluffing, and the other side sort of, hey, they're doing all right. But in a double bluff, where you're miles apart, you know that they're that they're bluffing and you're bluffing, and I'll be damned if I'm going to go first. And and there's a lot of a face, and for the lawyers and for the clients, 
And, and one of the big problems we have is, is are you at kind of the end of the road? In other words, is, if they walk, is it over um, or not? And in many cases, certainly litigation-based mediations, you've got lots of chance to, to recover. You've got the settlement conference. You've got on the steps. So that a lot of them are going to look at this. Well, it's my resistance point, but it's not really my resistance point today when I look at it. Uh, we'll, we'll capture it later on if we need be. And, and that's one of the great problems with mediation generally, uh, where it's not uh, at the end of the, end of the day. And then finally, I'm afraid there's the interests of lawyers who aren't always aligning, as I say, a euphemism with uh, settlement um, in the sense that if it keeps on going, obviously they build more and make more uh, those that work on that basis. So, so there's a whole bunch of factors. Uh, and, um, you know, how do you get out of it? Well, um, you've got to evaluate the extent you can. And it's tough when you're right in it. And that's one of the advantages a mediator has is they can sort of get the feel more. Is this a single or a double bluff? And, uh, and where, where the problem is, uh, you know, you, you call the bluff out. Obviously, you can't do it if you're double bluffing because it's pretty tough. Uh, they say, sure, sure. Um, but a single bluff, you can do it to a certain extent. Uh, like, we've been reasonable, da, da, da. You folks aren't being reasonable. You know what it is. Uh, I mean, this is ridiculous. You can call it out and, uh, you know, you're exposed and you're not going to do any better. We're not changing the future, da, 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 and give them all that. You can do the walk away, uh, the faint walk away. Uh, and you certainly easier to do that with the mediators. We wring our hands and say, no, no, you can't go. Well, let's talk about this and keep them talking. It's our number one rule. Um, and uh, bring them back in. Uh, so, but uh, you can try to get across that this, this thing is going to end and maybe they don't want it to end and obviously it brings the mediator in. Um, you can query uh, whether it's a final offer. Oh yes, here's the issue. Here, here's the ethics issue. This is, this is where you start, uh, start really uh, corralling lawyers because lawyers are not supposed to lie and I'm going to get this across uh, and certainly uh, they're not to make a material representation. Something like a final offer is a material representation and they shouldn't be saying that, alright? So uh, you can query and you start asking questions, you know, is this your final Is this your final offer? Now I can do it better as a mediator uh, because the rule is really set up that you can't lie to the mediator. But uh, generally you can't lie in, in these mediations and uh, so I can ask these folks, I mean, is this really your final offer? Is this where you are? Well if not, well what's going on here then? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, and, uh, and uh, it, it, it boxes them in. But you can do that yourself if you're, if, you're, if you're sort of being moderate and you've got a single bluff on the other side, and you can call them up and say, well, you know, are you telling me this is your final offer? I mean, really? Is this where we're stuck? I mean, give me a break. And you'll find that they'll talk about it being a final offer for today, but not for always, maybe, who knows what. Um, the big rule, a big way we do it is meet with the lawyers. Somehow lawyers separated from clients, breaks down the face issue that we were talking about before and, and allows them to... It's difficult when they get sort of, you know, certainly if there's a lot of camaraderie as there are in, is in the Ottawa bar, for instance, um, you get uh, the reasonable people, you get them together with a mediator, reasonable mediator, and they start looking for solutions. So that's uh, the other way it's done. And, um, and then you can go into a bunch of impasse routines. I'm going to look at them later on when we, uh, when we get a real bluff, a real, not real, but a real impasse as opposed to bluffing impasse. And you can call on the mediator. And, and the mediators really do help um, in, a, in, a, in a double bluff. And even a single bluff, it, it, when, when they run into that situation, it's, uh, it's kind of tough. So from here, we're going to go on to um, final offers and uh, impasse and closing. Uh, but we'll do that in the next video.